Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Think 21, our higher education track. We're so excited that you all can join us, and we're especially excited to kick off our higher ed track today with Flower Darby, a, a speaker we were so pleased to welcome to this event. Uh, Flower has some great insights, great tips, and some really inspiring approaches and strategies for you to consider. She'll answer some questions for us at the end. And with that, I'm going to turn it right over to Flower. Flower, welcome. We're so glad to have you. Thank you so much, Linda. And thank you to everyone who is making the time to be here today. I really appreciate your interest in learning more about how we can teach effectively in new formats and how we can really rethink the classroom experience in 2020 to 21 and beyond because we're only at the beginning here. Uh, I just want to tell you a little tiny bit about myself. I am faculty and instructional designer at Northern Arizona University, and I'm the author of a book, Small Teaching Online, which is all about little things that we can do in online environments, whether we're teaching live synchronous like this kind of a format, or whether we're teaching asynchronous in our learning management systems, what are some small things that we can do to really engage our students and help them to learn in these new environments? Now, some of the environments aren't necessarily new, but there's a lot of things that are different about what we're doing these days as opposed to what we had been doing before the pandemic. Now, my background, I teach English, I teach Pilates, I teach technology, leadership, and dance classes. I have been teaching in higher education both in the university and community college setting for 25 years. And so I'm happy to be with you here today to share some ideas, some insights, some overarching principles, and a few practical tips as well about what we can do as we rethink that classroom experience. Before we go any further, I would love to tell you a little bit about who I am outside of the school setting. This is my wonderful family. My uh, charming husband is a strong partner and collaborator in my work. He has been a strong, again, a partner since I have been teaching these past 25 years. We have three daughters, ages 13, 14, and 16, so it is always exciting around our house when it's not a global pandemic. We love to travel overseas, our favorite place is to go to London. So you see a couple of pictures of us there. One is in the London Eye looking down toward the city, and one is in Piccadilly Circus, one of my favorite places on the planet. But what you also see in the bottom corner there is what online learning has been looking like at my house this past year. That's two of my daughters sitting in Zoom class and also playing a game on the living room floor. And so while it's not ideal, we know that it can be challenging to hold the attention of our students when we are teaching synchronous live, when they are engaging in asynchronous formats. We know that there are challenges in in these things that we need to find solutions for. And that's why we're here today. We want to rethink what it means to teach effectively in these new formats. We want to figure out how do we engage our students, the people who are in our classes, how do we engage them at a difference, or sorry, at a distance? How do we engage them differently because they're at a distance? That's what we're really here to think about today. You know, we can harness the power of new technologies, new tools, and new ways of doing things in the formats that we are now teaching in. Lots has changed within this past year, and we're here today to spend some time together thinking about how we can take advantage of the tools and the technologies. What do we need to know to really teach effectively and help our students learn well in these spaces? Because we need to forge a new way forward. Things are different, as I have said, than they were even a year ago. We are looking at a new future, a new um, opportunity to engage remote students and learning how we can do that effectively. As we do, it's important for us to do this in community. That's the value of an event like today's because it's really important to learn from other people, to get ideas, to find inspiration for what other people are doing in their teaching with technology approaches, in their solutions, and in their strategies. It's good to get new ideas, new ways of doing things, and we can do that better 
together. So that's what I love about an event like this. As Linda mentioned, we will have some time for questions at the end. So feel free to make a note of your questions, jot them down. You can put them in the comment section if you would like. And um, that will be part of the way that we find inspiration and ideas from each other is through that dialogue that we have planned for the end of our time together. Now, let's think about the impact of COVID-19. It has literally shattered everything that we knew about higher education. Sure, teaching with technology existed before March of 2020. Sure, teaching in online spaces existed, online classes certainly did. But as I've been saying, everything changed uh, as we moved on a dime to transition to fully remote, fully virtual instruction a year ago this time and since then have been working to reconceive of paradigms that we have taken for granted for a really long time. And so today we want to think about what these changes mean and how we can look forward to what's ahead. We really see a bright future, but a different future than we might have imagined prior to COVID-19. Technology will absolutely take on more importance in our teaching and learning. We are not going back. Now, I will say many of us, most of us are looking forward to getting back into the classroom and to interacting with our students in person. Some of us are already doing that, perhaps teaching with masks, socially distanced, but we, we're looking at what comes next. Many faculty are asking that question. Uh, again, I would argue that things that we have learned and experimented and tried in this past year, they're going to be continued in development. We're not going to put any genies back in any bottles. The future is here and we are looking for new ways to teach even more effectively with technology and, as I said before, to engage students at a distance. And yet, as we do that, as we think about what teaching and learning looks like in remote spaces, in online spaces, using all the technology that is available to us, we don't want to forget the importance of having other people with us as we learn. Other people really do help us to be successful in learning contexts. Now, this is a, an image of a Pilates class. I teach Pilates, as I mentioned to you, and I just want to take a moment to share a story, something that happened in my Pilates class in June of 2019, before we were in a pandemic, back when we used to go to the gym without wearing masks. Something happened, and it's really caused me to think deeply about why it's helpful to have other people around us. I was getting ready to teach on this beautiful summer day. I had cut it just a little bit close on time. I wasn't late for class but I wasn't very early and I was uh, coming into the gym building following a woman who was walking in with her rolled up yoga mat and I thought oh good somebody came to class because it was a beautiful summer day but as I rounded the corner into the hallway where the studio is I saw her standing outside the open door and I thought why doesn't she go in and immediately I was able to answer myself. It's because she didn't know if she was supposed to. The door was open, but because I wasn't there yet, she was standing there not knowing if she should go in. The lights were off, there was no music playing, nobody else was there yet. And she was standing there with this tangible, palpable, sense of confusion. Am I in the right place at the right time? Is class even happening? What's going on? So because I picked up on that in that moment, I said to her, are you here for class? And she said, yes. And I said, great, me too. Come on in. We got the lights on. We got the music playing. We proceeded to have a really good session. More people showed up and it was a great class. But it really got me thinking about how uh, we are challenged when we are learning in isolation. And that's mostly what we've been doing for this past year, learning within our little boxes or in the learning management system, interacting, generally speaking, by ourselves. Even before the pandemic, it was most common that online students would be engaged in their coursework without the benefit of having somebody next to them the way that we do in a classroom. We learn from each other all the time. Students do, for example, when they're sitting in person, they might see that everybody is getting out their notes. And so they say, oh, great, good time to get out my notes right now. But when we're in isolation, we face new challenges and new barriers. And that's important to understand is that there are some challenges in this environment, things that we need to understand so that we can overcome those challenges, so that we can identify solutions that will work to help us 
keep the attention of our students so that they're not playing a game with their sibling or roommate while they're also engaged in our class. And I think it's important to recognize that I would argue that we don't know enough about online teaching and learning. If you think about it, we have been in physical classrooms for literally decades by the time that we begin teaching classes. We've been enrolled as students for years and years, and maybe we had opportunities to be a teaching assistant or something like that. But now as educators, we have a range of wealth of experience in these physical spaces. We know what teaching and learning looks like. We know where the desks and the chairs should be. The front of the room has a whiteboard, a lectern, a screen, a projector. We know where we are supposed to go and what we are supposed to do, and so do our students. Now, I would argue this will come with time and the pandemic has almost certainly accelerated it. But where we are today is that we do not have the breadth of experience online as we do in person. We are not as comfortable and as confident in the way that we teach and interact with our students in online spaces. However, uh, we know that it really is important to uh, pay attention to the experience of the people in our classes. Here's a representative student and a representative faculty member. And now there is research that came out of 2020 asking students, what are some of the big challenges that you experienced in this emergency pivot to virtual instruction? And one of the main challenges that students um, express or experienced is feeling disconnected, feeling like they were cut off from their faculty members, from their friends and their peers, from their on-campus experience, just feeling disconnected, cut off, adrift. Now, the number one challenge that faculty reported from 2020, and you might be able to resonate, this might uh, sound familiar to you, is keeping students engaged. How do you know? Are your students, in fact, playing a game with a friend? Are they online somewhere doing something else? Are they even sitting at the in front of their screen, paying attention and learning? Um, that, that lack of engagement is really challenging for faculty. But you see, when I think about the number one challenge that students complained about, feeling disconnected, and the number one challenge that faculty complained about, keeping students engaged, those are twin sides of the same coin. That's, that's the same problem. If we can help our students feel more connected, then we can help them stay more engaged. What we also know about teaching and learning in online spaces is it's so important to foster connections and community that this kind of engaged interaction really does help people learn. But the question that we're asking ourselves right now is how how do we create this kind of an interaction in online spaces? It's different, it's hard. This kind of engagement can happen sort of almost naturally, effortlessly when we're together in the same room, but it's harder to structure this kind of interaction online. However, we do have a, some research. I would say we need more research. I'm, I'm making a call for that. But we do definitely have um, a body of literature that talks about what we know about how to foster those kinds of interactions. And just to lay a little bit of groundwork, we're going to look very quickly at three guiding frameworks to help us think about how do we foster those connections in online spaces. First is the well-regarded, maybe you're familiar with it, the well-respected community of inquiry framework, Garrison, Anderson, and Archer 2000 um, published an analysis, uh, a study where they had sought to understand what goes into really good online classes, or as they called it then in the late 1990s when they were conducting this research, what goes into computer mediated instruction, which is a term that I think is really apt these days. We're doing a lot of instruction mediated by computers. So they identified these three presences that are uh, depicted here in the center of this graphic. And again, this is the original community of inquiry framework. And for me, these presences are like ingredients. So the first one makes a lot of sense to me in a teaching and learning context. That's the cognitive presence. That's the thought work that students are engaged in. How are they learning new information? How are they understanding it, remembering it? How are they relating it to what they already know? How are they constructing new meaning based on their experience? How are they using that information to solve equations, to analyze case studies, 
whatever it might be, it's the thought work. And again, that really makes sense. It's also your thought work. What have you planned? What have you created? What have you selected for your students to engage in and to demonstrate their, their learning um, in these online spaces? The cognitive presence is the one that makes the most sense, I would say. The other two in this original community of inquiry framework, that's where I would argue we're still working right now. The teaching presence, how do we interact with our students in order to guide and facilitate their learning? We know what it looks like in person. I would argue we're still learning how to do this online. And the social presence, how do we just interact with our students as people? How do we greet them in the hallway and say, hey, you're in the right place at the right time. Come on in. Let's get the lights on. Let's get the music playing. And, and let me be clear. I am not recommending that we should be online 24 seven so that anytime students click into our classroom or our learning management system that they are um, seeing that we're physically there. That is not possible. It is not healthy. It is not sustainable. But what we want to do is to create a feeling of a welcoming environment that students are in the right place at the right time so that they sense that we are there even if we aren't necessarily there. And Part of that social presence is helping students to relate with each other and feel like there really are real people in the class with them. Now, in 2012, another couple of researchers came along, Cleveland Inns and Campbell came along and they said, you know what, this is really good, but we're missing something. We need to draw out this fourth presence, the emotional presence. And they proposed this addition. Now, some colleagues and I at Northern Arizona University, we conceive of this as so important that we depict it and circling everything that happens in online spaces. Emotions are part of what we do online, but it may be something that you haven't thought about before. If you're having kind of a, a frustrating day or if you're feeling particularly distant from your students, that's going to impact the way that you communicate with them. On the other hand, if you're all jazzed up about what you have to talk about that day, again, that uh, sense is going to come through in your teaching. Students bring their emotions into our online spaces as well. And let's face it, we're all processing a lot emotionally right now. We're living in a pandemic. There are all kinds of societal issues and tensions that we're dealing with right this moment, burdens that we're carrying, anxieties that we're carrying, and students and ourselves, we bring these emotions into the space. But the good news is that we can put emotions to work for us. They are powerful. They are tools that we can use to engage our students, help them to focus and pay attention and to really learn meaningfully. So we're going to be looking just a little bit at a few practical suggestions of how we can combine those three, the teaching presence, the social presence, the emotional presence, and how we can put that to work for us in order to foster those connections and community and collaboration. Now, two other frameworks. I don't have a lot of time, but I just need to run these past you so that you at least have a passing familiarity with, the, with them. One is universal design for learning, and that's all about making sure that all of our students have access to what they need to get to. UDL is uh, based on the concept of universal design that comes out of the physical world, the built environment. So picture a ramp that goes up next to a set of stairs that makes it easier for someone who's using a wheelchair to get to where they need to go. But what we know about that ramp is that it benefits lots of other people too. A parent pushing a stroller or somebody who has a suitcase with rolly wheels, perhaps a delivery person who has a cargo dolly full of shipment. All of these people benefit from that ramp, even if they're not the people that it was put there for. And that's what UDL does. It helps us to think about reframing the need to accommodate learners' needs in order to be in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. And it helps us to think about, let's build in some on-ramps and some options and supports so that all of our students can benefit from those things, build them in from the get-go. So UDL is something just to at least be aware of. We want to provide options and support to our students. And then finally, I think it's really important in this day and age um, to really think about including all of our students. Culturally responsive online pedagogy or teaching, these are things that um, help us to be aware 
that just like our emotions, we bring our cultural values into our online spaces as well. And our cultural values shape our behavior and how we do what we do in these spaces. So if we want to be equitable and inclusive, if we want to teach socially just classes, then we need to be aware of cultural differences and how we can plan for, um, you know, to accommodate students from diverse backgrounds. And this is Courtney Plotz, by the way. I have her on the screen because she's doing really good work in thinking about how do we support culturally diverse learners in our online classes in particular. So with that, that's just kind of an overview of the frameworks. Again, I don't have time to go into depth, but at least an introduction to frame our thinking about um, how we can be more effective as we're teaching and learning in online spaces. We're gonna turn now to some very practical strategies that are designed to foster that kind of inclusive and equitable engagement. Because we can have all the technology in the world, we can have all the bells and whistles, but if we're not holding the attention of our students, if we're not keeping them engaged with us, then we're not going to be very effective in our education. So we want to really foster those connections that we talked about. And that's where I'm going to focus my remarks today. Uh, I know you have additional sessions coming up today about how we can use some of the tools even more effectively. But I'd like to start us off today by thinking about how we work with the people in our classes. In order to do that, I'm relying on the work of Josh Eiler. He's the author of a book called How Humans Learn, and he has a whole chapter on how important our sociality is and how it does, in fact, drive our learning. So he makes the point that even literally from day one, as newborns, we are watching other people around us. We are learning from their responses to our efforts to communicate. And of course, that kind of learning from other people, that continues through infancy as we learn how to hold a, a bottle or a sippy cup, as we learn how to use a spoon. You never see a parent teaching a, an infant how to hold the bottle, right? There's never bottle holding lessons. People, infants in this case, learn by watching how other people um, do things. And this continues through infancy, toddlerhood, young childhood, and forever, really. We're always learning from other people, just like um, what happened that one day in my Pilates class. I didn't tell you this, but something else happened that was kind of interesting that day. Uh, as we were getting ready to start the class, I saw that there were two yoga mats really, really close together. And I thought, I bet I know what happened. I asked, as I often do at the beginning of class, anybody brand new to Pilates? Sure enough, the person who had set her yoga mat so close to her friends raised her hand. And although I didn't ask her this, I'm pretty sure that she put her mat real close to her friends because she wanted to be able to peek over, see if she was doing it right. Did she have the correct position of the head and neck? things like that. And uh, so, like I said, I think we all benefit when there are other people nearby that we can learn from. And yet, that is one of the main challenges that we face in these online environments. So we're going to look at our sociality. We're also going to consider the science of emotion. As I said, there's actually a lot of power here. This is Sarah Rose Cavanaugh. She's the author of a book called The Spark of Learning, how we energize college teaching with the science of emotion. And she has made the compelling argument based on recent neuroscience that emotion and cognition, they are inextricably linked you cannot separate them. And this flies in the face of one of our cherished beliefs in academia. We like to think that the pursuit of knowledge should be cold and rational. There is no room for emotion here, but actually that's not true. We need that emotion. We cannot think without emoting. They're, again, the recent neuroscience is showing that they are neurobiologically interdependent. You can't do one without the other. And the beauty of it is emotions are really powerful. We can put them to work to us to help our students pay attention, to motivate them, to help them remember what they're learning, to help them focus on the task at hand. So we want to think about how we can put emotions to work and combine it with fostering those social connections um, in order to help our students to be more effective and learn and stay engaged in these online environments. The first thing that we can do as we're teaching our students in whatever format, that's, we could, this applies in the classroom as well, but I would argue that in these online spaces, we're up against those additional challenges related to the isolation, 
relating to the distance and the screens, uh, what we can do is we can bring our passion to create the atmosphere. So no matter what you're teaching, no matter what tools and technologies you're using, think about taking a few mindful moments before you enter into that online space and remind yourself just what it is that you love about what you're teaching. Why is it so important to you that you made it your life's work? Or if you happen to be teaching part-time, why do you make the time to do that in addition to your other responsibilities? Why do you think it's so important for your students to know this information, to understand these concepts? We do this, we have a driving passion, not very many of us do this for the money. It doesn't pay that well. We do this because we care about what we're teaching our students. And so take those few mindful moments and bring that passion. Remind yourself why you do what you do. Now, how? How do you do this? Actually, before we talk about how, let me just explain the theory that this is founded on. There is such a thing called emotional contagion. And what this means is that we impact and are impacted by the emotions of other people around us. So for example, if you're at a packed sporting event back in the days <laughs> of the pandemic and looking forward, hopefully in the future, we'll be, we'll be able to do this again. Uh, when you're at that packed sporting event and the home team scores the winning goal or touchdown or basket, whatever it might be, the whole crowd erupts and says, yeah, that's because the emotions of the crowd are elevated because everybody is experiencing the same thing at the same time. So this happens in the real world. It absolutely happens online as well. We impact and are impacted by the emotions of other people. If you're skeptical about whether that happens online, I would encourage you to think about social media. We are impacted by the emotions of other people all the time in those social media interactions and spaces. So how? Let's turn our attention to how do we bring the passion? Well, in one way, I'm doing it right now. I'm encouraging you to take a cue from my delivery here. I am absolutely doing everything I can to convey my passion for effective online teaching. We can do this. It can be good. There are strategies that we have available to us. And I am amplifying my presentation style. I am projecting about 250% energy right to you through the webcam. It's exhausting. When we're done here, I'm going to fall on the floor in a heap of exhaustion. But right now, I'm here with you, and I'm projecting a lot of enthusiasm and energy right to you because I literally want to infect you with my enthusiasm, with my excitement. It's contagious, and I want to share it with you. You can do the same thing when you're teaching via video, whether that's live like this is, whether you're pre-recording some mini uh, lecture videos, which is a really great strategy to provide that inclusive and equitable access. If you're teaching to the camera, bring that passion, exam or I should say exaggerate your presentation style. The camera eats your energy. So big facial expressions, lots of smiles, uh, lots of vocal intonations. These kinds of things can help keep your students engaged with you as they literally catch your energy, your passion, and your enthusiasm. You can also do this in written form. So if you're teaching um, an online class and you're using your learning management system, whether that be Canvas or Blackboard Learn, Moodle, whatever it might be, D2L, lots of good systems out there. There's a lot of written interaction in those spaces. So be mindful to infuse your writing to your students with your energy, your positivity, your confidence, your optimism that students can be successful. When I first started teaching asynchronous online classes about 13 years ago, I used to send announcements that would read like this. Don't forget you have a quiz on Friday. I don't talk like that to my students. Why was I writing to them like that? I had turned into a robot teacher somewhere along the way. What I learned over time, and then I learned that emotion science backs me up on this, is that when I write in a tone of voice that's more natural to me and with a deliberate effort to infuse warmth and support and encouragement into my writing, that students respond well to that. It helps them. It helps them to persist and to engage. So now when I write an announcement like that, and it will read something like this. Hey, everybody, you're doing a great job. We've really come a long way so far this semester. Don't forget, we have a quiz on Friday. And as a reminder, we do have tutoring services or whatever it might be. That sounds like me. 
Now you might be sitting here and thinking, well, that doesn't sound like me. And that's important. You must write and communicate in a way that is authentic to your own style, to your teaching persona. But I would encourage you to infuse your written communications with your enthusiasm, with your support, with your encouragement for your students as well. Uh, one other very practical thing that you can do to bring your passion into your online engagement with your students if you see something out there in the real world that is so fascinating, so interesting, or that really gets your attention, you're super curious about it. If you see it in the real world and you say that, that's why we're doing what we're doing here. That's why we have to understand these concepts. It's because of this. Well, take advantage of the technology and bring that into your class. You have the opportunity to bring a link, to share a video, to link to a news article, a blog post, a TED talk, whatever it might be. Uh, that is how we can convey whatever we found really interesting, fascinating, whatever got us really curious. Again, we can share that with our students, even by just bringing something in from the outside world. And then we want to engage with our students on that topic about that thing. Look at this, isn't it interesting? And engage with your students in a discussion, whether that be in live synchronous online teaching, whether it be in the asynchronous discussion forum. Um, look for ways to, to share your enthusiasm and your interest and your excitement with your students. So just something to be thinking about. How do we bring our passion? Now, my next recommendation here is a combination of emotional science, but also the social connections that we need, because um, what we also know from the research is that it really is important to foster these connections. And let me just explain what I mean here. What we know from the research is that when we form an emotional connection with something, we can think more deeply about it. In fact, the research shows that we only think deeply about things we care about. That's mind blowing. Let me say that again. We only think deeply about things that we care about. And so as educators, let's help our students care about what they're learning. And we can do that when we help them to form emotional con connections with both the information, the concepts, and also the people. If our students care more about who we are as people, if they care more about us, it will actually motivate and engage them, or sorry, it will motivate them to engage when they might otherwise be tempted to drift off or to be playing a game with their sibling on the living room floor. So this is actually why I have that meat flower Darby slide at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, you don't know me from Boo, probably. You don't know anything about my life outside of the school setting, but I deliberately include that slide so that you can see a little bit about who I am. And that helps to establish that connection between us. So I encourage you to do something like that. Now, let let me clarify. If I were presenting here in person, I probably wouldn't have that slide. It's not the kind of thing that I usually do when I'm with people in the room because it's easier to create that connection when we're together. But in these online spaces, we want to make that extra effort. So whether you include a slide like that, if you're not comfortable showing the faces of your family members, that's OK. Include pictures of your pets. People love to see pictures of pets. They It bonds us just like that. Or include pictures of your favorite destinations. Maybe it's your backyard, your local park, your hiking trail. Maybe it's an exotic destination. Um, include photos or representative images of favorite activities and hobbies. Things like this help your students to form that connection with you. And by the same token, we can also use this, put this to, into effect in terms of helping them care about what they're learning. So there was research that came out in 2009, and just briefly, um, the researchers were able to show deeper understanding, better learning when they added a, uh, a scenario or a case study to the project as opposed to the bare facts. So the in, in this case, it was an economics class. Students in the control group were given the project of proposing a business plan of opening a coffee shop and showing how the profit margin was going to play out. And students in the experimental group were given a story. They were given information about the district and the city and the neighborhood where this coffee shop would be, the people who would be frequenting the coffee shop, the delivery people. And that story, those fictional personas, 
uh, led, and as I said, the researchers were able to demonstrate better learning and better understanding of the economic concepts at play. So anything you can do to tell a story to form those emotional connections. Now we can do this in a couple of different sort of broad categories. One is to think about the way that you present the information, just like that example I just shared with you. Is there a story you can tell, even if it's personal? Can you, can you paint a scene to help students really relate and, and just imagine what the situation will be like in order to help them connect? But you can also think about, again, taking advantage of media uh, because it is really very powerful. So, for example, you could have a very rigorous and robust analysis of a refugee crisis somewhere in the world, and it could just look like a wall of text to your students. It's very off-putting, very disengaging. But the instant that you put that photo of the toddler child with the big eyes looking at the camera, maybe with a scuff on their face, and you've got your students' attention, like that. They connect with that child, they connect with the humanity of the situation, and you have the attention of your students in a very different way. So think about putting these emotions to work, forming those connections. I have a friend who teaches literature, and he provides audio recordings of the poets narrating the poems in his online classes, and that helps the students understand the meaning of the poems much better than just reading the words on the page or the screen because the narration, the performance of the poem brings the meaning to life, the vocal intonations, the pauses for emphasis, the raw emotion that comes through the poet's voice. Students get a much better understanding of the material. So think about ways that you can present, tell a story, show a picture, um, bring something to life through media, through recordings, audio or video, in order to help your students form those connections. Now, the other sort of main category of way of, of how you can help students foster these connections is to think about the activities that you give them. So anything that we can do that helps them to care more about what they're learning, that they find more interesting, more fun. Let's remember enjoyment is an emotion. So if students enjoy what they're doing while they're learning, they will be more engaged. I have a friend, a physics uh, professor who teaches bungee jumping Barbie, and students have to calculate the exact amount of cord required for Barbie to jump from various heights before she goes splat on the rocks. It's fun, students love it. They love to picture Barbie all splatted on the rocks. They're still doing physics, they're still engaging in the equations that are necessary, and they're having fun while they're doing it. I have another friend who has a discussion forum in her class. She teaches uh, pop culture in literature and film, and she asks her students to post a discussion entry about what their one superpower would be. If they could choose any superhero power, what would it be and why? Students love talking about their superpowers. They are so engaged. It's interesting. It's fun for them. And then she crafts a learning conversation through the way that she guides the interactions and asks leading questions. She, she crafts that into a conversation about class themes like good versus evil like character development, things like this, that students get to the learning through a really fun and interesting activity. So just thinking about how we help students care. Now you can do this in a much more sobering way as well. Maybe you want students to explore the gravity of a situation or the seriousness of what you're teaching and thinking about how you frame the presentation and the activities that you ask students to engage in can really help them to to form that emotional connection. Now there's one other um, thing that I want to demonstrate for you. I have a little act activity for you just to engage in on your own uh, as another way that we can foster this kind of emotional connection and, and put emotions to work for us. Now you may not have realized this or thought much about it before, but there are such a things as, uh, that sentence didn't come out right, we have something that we can call uh, knowledge emotions. And that is when um, something really helps us to uh, think and process information but also evokes a little bit of an emotional response as well. And the two main examples that I like to share with people are curiosity 
and interest. So anytime that you can get students curious about something, anytime you can ask them questions or have them predict an outcome before you give them information, anytime you can draw their attention to what's so interesting as we were talking about before, when it catches your interest, it helps students to learn as well. That kind of um, evoking of curiosity and interest can be very effective. So I'm going to walk us through just a little demonstration of this. It won't take long. Do this on, on your own. You can um, make your guesses on paper with a pen, or you can just think of a number. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you three questions that came out of research on faculty perceptions of online teaching. This study was conducted in 2017, pre-pandemic, over 13,400 faculty members at a range of institutions teaching online, teaching in person. This research is about what faculty think about online teaching. I'm going to ask you three questions about the findings, and I'm going to invite you to guess the answer. So the first question is that um, whether, sorry, the, the first question is researchers asked faculty, do you believe that online education makes it more possible for more people to go to school? Do you believe that that is, you know, what do you think that that increases access? In your own head or on your notes, uh, make, a, make a guess. What do you think that percentage would be? What percentage of the 13,400 faculty members uh, who responded to this survey would say, yeah, online education makes it easier for more people to get a college degree? Well, the answer is 79%. 79% of faculty in 2017, I'm curious about this because again, that was pre-pandemic, believe that online education increases access. Now, of those faculty respondents, how many of them think that online education doesn't work, that it's not as effective, that students can't learn as well in these spaces? What percentage would you guess? Well, the answer is almost half. Almost half of those 13,400 faculty members are skeptical about whether this works. Again, pre-pandemic, I'm very curious what the responses would be now, but um, this actually motivates my work because it can be good. It absolutely can be as effective there is robust research to show that learning outcomes can be just as good, if not better, in online spaces when we know what we're doing to help our students be effective and to learn. So this is sobering to me, but also motivating. Now, one final question from this study, and that is, what percentage of those 13,400 respondents love teaching online? Never need to teach in person again. Just love teaching in online spaces. What would you guess? Well, the answer is 9%. 9%, 2017 pre-pandemic, love teaching online. I'm curious what that number would be right now. But again, this really motivates my work because I believe that we can love teaching online. Sometimes I, I feel that we, we haven't properly been prepared. We haven't had time to really equip ourselves, but that's what we're doing here today. That's why we're here is so that we can really learn uh, how to love what we do. And so let me just unpack this activity. What we're doing is we're designing for curiosity and for interest, because here's what I know. When I asked you those questions and you guessed the number or the answer to those questions, before I revealed that answer, you were on the edge of your seat. You could hardly wait to find out what was that answer going to be? What would that number be? Because you guessed, and that taps into the learning science around predicting that when we predict the outcome of something, we naturally are more focused on learning what happens. In fact, that's why if you engage in a football pool in your office or your department, that uh, you are then prone to watching the entire football season more closely because you predicted the winner of the Super Bowl. And so uh, we can put that to work in our teaching, not always just telling our students what we want them to know, but framing things in terms of questions, inviting them to guess, to wonder what could be to make predictions. Now, of course, these need to be low stakes, but if, if you're solving an equation, you can ask students, what do you think comes next? What do you think the outcome will be? Whatever it might be, get your students thinking and curious and wondering, and it will help you to pay attention. Uh, sorry, it will help them to pay attention to you. Now, one last kind of practical recommendation that I want to share with you here today, and that is to do everything that you can to create a welcoming tone. Now, as I said, 
we have so much available to us in terms of technology, so many things that we can do to really convey concepts, information, to demonstrate problem solving, all these things. But if we are not creating that really inclusive and warm and supportive environment, it's, it's not going to be quite as effective. Your students, like my daughters, might be tempted to drift off and play a game on the living room floor. And so when we really invest in connecting with students through the screen, through the camera, even as I said before, in our learning management systems, create a sense that the lights are on, that the music is playing and students are in the right place at the right time in all the ways that you communicate with your students and in the ways that you seek to connect with them as people. What we know again is that no matter what happens with technology and it is coming it is here. There is so much potential. It's so exciting. But without the support of the other people, it's just not going to be as effective. We need to focus, keep our focus on collaborations and community because the technology is not going to do the teaching for us. You are required, the expert in your field, the, the person who knows how to explain complicated concepts and provide another example or another analogy to help students understand uh, how this phenomenon works. That uh, interaction is what is really important in these online spaces. A book came out this past year, 2020, this is Justin Reich. He's the author of this book called Failure to Disrupt, Why Technology Alone Can't Transform Education. And he makes a really interesting argument along the lines of what I was just saying. The tech doesn't teach. He analyzes things, for example, like MOOCs, those massive online open courses that never really took off and had the impact that um, they were predicted to have. And it's because it is, uh, it's less collaborative, less interactive. The technology can't do the teaching. We have to do the teaching. And one of the arguments that Reich makes is that for example, computer co programs are really good at super linear, super well-defined things. So we can program if this, then that, but what we cannot program in a computer software system is how to communicate with complexity. And as I thought about it, this is the essence of teaching. This is what we do. Our students sometimes have additional questions, areas of confusion. They need us to explain something again. They want that back and forth in order to not just be listening or, or learning, I should say, from a video on YouTube or a tutorial manual. They want the interaction because they need their questions answered. They need you to engage in complex communication. And this is why I argue that the technology can't do it. You have to do it. There is a place for you. Now, we have an, op an opportunity to use technology in really cool and exciting ways, but it's still about how we support our students. Again, as we look forward to what's coming next, we know that the technology that is coming down the line that is already here, it really enables us to do some really exciting, innovative, engaging things, and it's important that we don't forget about the people in our classes. We need to foster those connections. The people are at the center of what we do and it's our role as educators using technology effectively. And I think my cat is walking behind me there. That's something that's happening these days, right? Uh, it's our role as educators to really keep the focus on the people while we are learning how to teach with technology more effectively. As we meet the moment, as we rethink the classroom experience from here, it's about using tech well, but it's also, and importantly, I would say most importantly, about engaging with our students and our learners in these spaces. So with that, I am going to see what questions, what comments we have. Linda, I know that you were standing by ready to, um, to engage here. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting by <laughs> in front of my screen. <laughs> sitting by. Yes. Flora, that was just fabulous and such great inspiration as we really think about the way we're developing instruction, delivering instruction, and supporting the, the whole the whole learning experience. So you've you've given us a lot to think about and and I, I thought we might take a few minutes and I'm gonna ask you um, in your book, uh, Small Teaching, 
small teaching online, you you spend some time on technology and and how faculty can use tools, choose tools, and not be used or chosen by tools. Um, yes. And some of that has to do with being intentional about instruction and the way you're designing courses. But I'd love to let you talk about that. Um, and how do you know as, as uh, you know, as an educator, what tool is right at what time and particularly for these online students? That is a wonderful question, Linda. Perfect. Thank you for the opportunity to expand on that just a little bit. I think you hit the nail on the head. You yourself said we want to be intentional with the technology that we choose and not let ourselves get chosen by the technology. As I said at the beginning, I've been teaching for 25 years. And if I had a dime for every time that I decided to try something new just because my colleague said it was really cool, there's my cat again. Hello. Um, <laughs> See, we're we're keeping it real here. She never it's does. Not, this She's only yeah. It's all good. Don't <laughs> worry. I myself have been really prone to trying the brand new shiny technology, the new app, the new system, the new website to get students to engage with me. And I can tell you that when we do it without a good pedagogical purpose, without a direct connection to. Uh, aligning with our learning goals for the class, that's when it is least successful. So we definitely want to think about whatever that technology might be, uh, whether it is video instruction, whether it is um, annotation device, whether it's a, a learning retrieval app that we use to help students remember, whether it's polling. Polling can be really effective, but we still want to make sure that we're using it for a good pedagogical reason. And I do have one other recommendation on this note as well. That is that we really need to be confident with the technology that we choose to use in our classes. Now that might mean some practice because you know the way I think about it, when we first started teaching in person, we were probably more nervous than we are today. It took us longer to get ready for class. Uh, we felt more anxious as we walked into the physical classroom when we were new at it. But with time and experience, we became more confident and more competent as well. And the same thing with technologies that we use in our teaching. I'm not saying that you have to be perfect, but you should have a fair level of, of comfort with tech that you're going to be using for for your classes because I even was speaking with a student just a few weeks ago and she said if the professor is learning the technology or the program at the same time as they want us to be learning it that doesn't really go very well so uh, make sure that you have a reason to use that tech that it supports your learning goals and make sure that you'll have some level of um, familiarity with how to use it as well. Hey, I think what we also hear from faculty is, I mean, uh, they're feeling enormous pressure to trot out more multimedia, yes. more more slide decks, mm -hmm. more videos, more, you know, and 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 it's it's almost um, solution overload. So I'm wondering if you know if you can talk a little bit about you know you don't you don't have to be. Um, George Lucas to use video in your in your classroom. I mean, you could, but so that so that people feel confident trying small things in 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 small interventions first, right? You know, Linda, I feel a little creeped out because I feel like you were reading my current book project that I'm writing right now. And it says in there, leave Hollywood to Hollywood. You don't have to be a multi-million dollar video company. What you have to be. So thank you for that cue. And I trust you haven't been accessing my documents. Honestly, um, but I haven't. <laughs> You're 100% right. What students want, we know this, there, there is robust evidence from the students. They want you. They want authentically you. If you trip over your tongue in your video instruction, that's okay. If your cat walks behind you on camera, that's okay. If your hair isn't perfect, um, if you are keeping things simple and lower tech, that is absolutely okay. Students are not going to be fooled that we are in a multi-million dollar Hollywood studio, but they want authentically you. And small teaching online really is about simple things that we can do, taking things in small steps. Just as an example today, I shared lots of ideas, lots of solutions, 
Uh, but here's what I would also add. Don't try them all at once. If you do, it's a guarantee for disaster. It's a recipe for disaster. Try one thing, one little thing, and um, get comfortable with that. See the improvement in student engagement. Tweak it, revise it, implement the way, um, you know, improve the way that you're implementing that, and then add something else. So simple, 100% important, uh, authentic. Um, don't feel like your video recording has to be perfect. I was talking to faculty last week who told me that sometimes they'll record their video announcement 20 times until they feel happy with the way it came through. And that is absolutely not necessary. When we teach in person, we trip over our tongues or we have a bad hair day or whatever it might be. So just learn to become a little bit more comfortable being yourself on the camera and in these online spaces as well. And, and try new things. And if they work for you, do more. If they don't work for you, put them aside. There's so many great, uh, great options. Flora, I'm also wondering if we can, you spent a lot of time on the big circle, the emotional response circle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think um, when we think about first year students who were never on a college campus and started college this year, whether two year school, four year school, or their graduate work, but they started online where they didn't know classmates, they didn't know faculty, or students who were having a terrific on-campus experience and suddenly that was that was shut down. Um, when we look at the K-12 side of the equation, we hear people talking a lot about social emotional needs for that group of learners and faculty. I'm wondering, are you experiencing the same in, in the higher ed environment? And can you give us some tips about how we can help students, how we can help colleagues? Um, I, think, I think you referred to it at one point as teaching humans, as we were talking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, right. And I believe this is something that, that higher education faculty know intuitively. But my sense is that prior to this pandemic, it may not have been something that we really thought a lot about. Again, because we are accustomed to teaching in person, even students who are taking our classes online, oftentimes they're still having a physical campus experience somehow or other. They can go to their physical campus to sign up for classes, <coughs> pay their bills, buy their books, whatever it might be. So this recognition that they are people in our classes and that establishing that relationship is so important. And talking to students about that as well. Here's an example. I am often asked when teaching live synchronous should I require my students to turn on their cameras? And, you know, right, we talked about this earlier, that it really does help me as your professor to be able to see you and see your head nods and your confused expression. It helps me when you have your cameras on, but I don't recommend that it should be required because there are equity considerations and it might reveal some challenges about students' home lives, for example, right. that would never right. that we would never see in the classroom. But what we can do is we can talk to our students as people and encourage that humanity and just say to our students, hey, you know what? It helps me. If you can turn on your cameras, please do. It really helps me. And so, like I said, just talking to our students even about um, how how we need to interact and form those connections. I think that can help them as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I I think in our just remaining one minute or so, if you can talk a little bit about the practicalities of engagement. There are techniques. Yeah. It's not just a dream. Student engagement. There are practical things. Sure, thank you. Good question, and I'll, I'll keep it short. But for example, I did not model best practice today. So ideally, if you were teaching to your students in a live format, you should not talk for 50 minutes straight and expect your students to be paying attention. I did that because of this format and because we're working with professionals here. But a practical thing to do is to stop every 10, 15 minutes, even eight to 12 minutes and check in with your students. Give them a quick poll. Ask them a question in the chat box. Are you with me? What, what question do you have at this time? Even ask them to use an emoji reaction to give you a response on how they're doing. Um, when you're teaching in the learning management system, make an effort to be in there multiple days per week and doing visible things, posting announcements, posting discussion replies, 
um, certainly yeah. grading and, and giving feedback so that you're there frequently. Yeah. Students see that you're there with them. That's awesome. Flower, this has been just the very best hour. Or as I called it, flower hour. It was just wonderful. <laughs> um, folks, um, we're going we're gonna to thank Flower. And we hope you'll join us for our next live session about sketch noting with Tim May. Um, to learn more about small teaching online, I personally would recommend that you get a hold of Flower's book, Small Teaching Online. And if you have other questions, you can send them in to us on the summit, uh, the summit site on YouTube. YouTube. And with that, Flower, we're going to say thank you. You have, you have, you have started us off wonderfully. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.